And welcome to another edition of Trader Talk TV. Today we've got Dominic Joseph, CEO of Captify in the office. Dom, welcome. Good to be here. It's been four years since the last time we yeah. had you at the, at the whiteboard. Yeah. So what's been going on with Captify? Because uh, an overview of what you've been doing in those four. Long, it's a big story, obviously, four years, but try and condense it into like 10 okay, seconds. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> Captify has grown significantly over the last four years. We know about 200 people working in many different countries around the world. So we've had a you know a, a, a rich learning curve, uh, you know, evolving the product, but also integrating into new markets and going to the U.S. and launching in New York is a pretty major shift for the business. And there's a whole load of dynamics over there that, that have really changed the game for us. Mm. Um, but also, yeah, on a technology and a product level, I think it's shifted quite a lot. And I think that right now we're going through a, a pretty major shift in the whole industry and how search and search intelligence is being applied into uh, the different sectors. So your business is focused around uh, your expertise in, in search data and how you apply that to the display marketplace. But today we're going to talk about sort of the evolution of search now and the, the idea that it's moving away from just being a Google silo to being permeating through the whole media landscape. And you've, you've uh, highlighted five areas that you think that this is th that we're heading in towards. So let's go through that and see where your thinking is in regards to some of these points. Well, yeah, I think that the, the kind of key point is that search has been perceived by many as just Google. Mm. And I think this is, the, this is really the year where that, the handcuffs have been taken off. And, you know, we're seeing a paradigm shift in this whole sector. And I think that's down to these, ma these five major changes in the state of play. Um, you know, Google is a walled garden. And, and as such, that's kind of stifled innovation for the industry. Very few other companies have been able to come in and innovate on that platform. And as such, it kind of got stuck in its ways. And mm. now that's really broken out. We, we say the handcuffs have really been, uh, been uh, taken off. Okay. So you've got five points in the board. Let's go through them individually. And th these are obviously very big area, big areas for the sort of evolution of search right now. And, and let's go through the first point here. So pubs monetize and search. Let's, let's talk about some of the, the pubs we're talking about. Because obviously these are scaled propositions globally, travel sites, e-commerce sites, mm. even media sites. So how is that sort of uh, working right now? Well, I mean, look, publishers have been typically monetizing their asset with display advertising, sponsorships, whatever else. And I think over the last five or six years, you know, uh, publishers have started monetizing their search data. Mm. You know, we've been putting code on, this, on these sites and SDKs in their apps and collecting the search data from these publishers. And this search data is really fantastic quality stuff. This is actually a layer down below Google. Google is really browsing search data. And then and that's, this is where they go after that. This is where they go to actually go and transact. And right. Actually go and look for that transaction. So this is sort of like hit Google, then the website, then yeah. search for stuff on the second layer, basically. Correct. So this is really good quality data. We currently collect about 33 billion searches a month. Um, about 2.2 .2 billion people. So um, that gives us a pretty good view of what's going on in the world. Um, what's going on with brands, products, trends. Um, this is all real-time data that's coming in. So the second major change, I think, is voice search. Uh, voice search is now predicted to, by 2020, um, account for about half of all searches in the world. Mm. Um, you know, and obviously now everybody's using it. Um, it's, it's fundamentally changed the way that search, is being, uh, search data is being uh, used. I think this is the first time that devices are starting to control the output of what happens to that data that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's created a rush to create devices, obviously, yeah. as that's the first in line to the consumer. Um, but actually, we think publishers still have the power here. Um, How so? Well, because publishers, consumers actually just like the experience of voice search. Yeah. Um, it's got many different perks to it. You can, you know, there's low friction on it. You can put many different data points in one stream of searching. But with the devices currently, they're disparate devices and they're quite restricted in that customer experience of what you get back from that search. And as such, the searches have evolved into being more commands. So that 50% of all searches being voice are actually mostly commands. Yeah. Um, and that's because with an audio response, you can only have one response. But actually, what a consumer wants when they're searching is multiple responses. And that's why Google over time has always been you know, such a fantastic experience for users because you can look at many different responses. So we actually think that actually um, the best customer experience lies within the publisher. So if you think about a retailer, for instance, if you can give them that same... Uh, voice search functionality for, for a user, that same, same great customer experience, but then have all the results customised to that particular user from their favourite publisher. Yeah. That's a really, really good customer but experience. But are you talking about, like, so let's think about it from an Alexa point of view, right? It sits in your bedroom or your kitchen or whatever and you're talking to the Alexa. So how, how would a publisher work within that ecosystem? Because obviously, 
Amazon has that relationship mm. with you, and Google, what's, what's the Google, um, Google device? Home, yeah. Google Home has a device too, and then obviously Siri and all the rest of it. So how does a publisher work in that ecosystem? So I'm curious, like, how, how do I interact with a brand like The Guardian or Telegraph or The Times or mm. The Financial Times? I mean, how can they, yeah. or, even, or even like a travel uh, website like Travago mm. or whatever? Well, we're, we're actually saying to not work in that ecosystem. We're right. actually saying go back to the ecosystem that exists already, which is phones, laptops, TVs. Ah, okay, right. So you give that voice search functionality back into those devices they've ah. already got. So you activate the microphone, you can then search. So know, within, as you were the, within the, the app itself, correct. Use a use a, a voice to sort of uh, interact with the app itself. Basically. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And this gives the power back to publishers. It stops Amazon and those kind of devices controlling the response and defeating the publishers and right. the retailers of this, right. of this industry. So. Um, and it gives an even better customer experience because they get a much broader range of products from yeah. their favourite publisher. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So is that so? How do you work with those particular publishers then? Like, if, like, if that's one of your segments in mm. terms of like where you get your data, mm. are you sort of work with the publishers in terms of those search, those voice search, or what way does it work? Yeah, that's right. So we built technology that uh, that publishes one of our publisher solutions. We have a range of things that we provide publishers with. So we can either monetize their data or mm. we can. Um, we can do their voice search for them, we do um, customized segments for them, we do content segmentation, we do audience extension, insights clearly, so a wide range of things. But voice search is clearly uh, one yeah, of the hottest trends you know, right. for publishers. Okay. And then your yeah, third one is uh, dynamic data. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, there's been uh, a, a lot of poor use cases with data over the last five years in programmatic. I think that is. It's created a lot of skepticism about the value of data coming into the uh, programmatic landscape and the use with, with DSPs. And, mm. and that's because people have been categorizing data with, with standardized, static, taxonomy segments. And that right. just doesn't work. You right. know, data is a living, breathing, breathing thing. You know, yeah. The search data of the population, you know, if you're looking at 2.2 billion, if we're talking about the UK, if we're looking at 60 people's billion, uh, you know, 60 people's... 60 million people's search behaviors. Yeah. That's happening right now, all day, every day, and it's changing based off language, time of day, location within that country. There's many different ways that change. So how can you have one static segment? This is completely dynamic, changing depending on what's going on. So when we look at all of our data, um, we, we've built a dynamic data structure called an ontology rather than a taxonomy. An ontology is, a, is really a dynamic structure where searches relate to other searches. And we don't know what they're going to be. You know, they just happen to be there by proximity. So what we see is we start to see clusters um, forming around uh, this, this ontology. And if we were looking at our whole universe, you might just see, you know, we can start to categorize based off that. So you might see travel, retail, you know, food, etc. Um, and that's the whole universe. But then marketers tend to... Do you have a uh, uh, rubber? Yeah. Oh, yeah, perfect. Um, marketers then... But, Marketers tend to hone in further on this dynamic data to solve their individual problem. So um, the challenge might be Christmas, mm. you know, and obviously that's coming up now. Brands are starting to plan for that in this, this summer, and you know, they're starting to now look at how data can inform um, their strategy, but also their targeting for Christmas. So if you look at Christmas, um, Christmas is a moment. Christmas is a calendar moment. Um, we've got various different types of moments. We have sporadic micro moments, which are really short bursts of time, and you can look at search data to pick off what's happening around that micro moment. We've got a life moment, which might be someone moving house or changing job. But then calendar moments are nice fixed periods of time in the calendar, and that would be Christmas, for instance. Yeah. So you've got the actual calendar moment of Christmas, but you've also got the lead up to it. Mm. And when we look at um, Christmas, you'll see things like clusters around tech, gifts. You might see fashion. You know, jewelry, you know, health and fitness. But then we'll see a massive one for toys, etc. But this all fits within the gifting part of the Christmas moment. But Christmas is interesting because there's many different other types of data sets that are going on around Christmas. We've got a huge one, which is travel. People like to go on holidays, people go and see their families, etc. Yeah, yeah. um, we have food. Music, film, I mean, you can go on all day. There's a million things that go on around Christmas. But with the ontology structure, you can actually then just see and visualize. And this is just one way of visualizing it. There's, an, there's loads of different ways we can do this. But you can start to see the connections that occur. So this gives marketers two, two use cases. They can either use it for targeting. Now, with targeting, they can see what products are trending, 
So last year we managed to predict and see that the fidget spinner was going to be a big really? stocking item. Okay. Because you know, yeah, people yeah, were yeah. looking where to get that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there's many different, you know, these will happen in every subcategory that there's product trends going on. And that's really useful information for brands of how to work out what to, how to advertise. But they can also see what users are fitting into those buckets. Mm. And those users can then be sent to the DSP to then activate media against. Yeah. So that for targeting, it's, it really is a marketer's dream because you've got real-time information of what's going on. Rather than just your theory, you can see right now what people are looking to buy and, and activate off those. And the second thing is insights. Which is your fourth thing up here. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that would be number four. Yeah. Um, insights, search data is only now starting to be used for insights. And it is the best data set for, um, for gleaning information of what is going on. You can, you can understand what your comp competition are doing. You can see what products, um, what, sand, uh, what brands, um, you can see uh, what consumers, if you wanted to look at a specific audience group, what their particular patterns are. And it's the stuff that you, you, you collate and bring into, into a visualization piece for, yes, for, right. for brands. Yeah, 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 we do that. We have, uh, you know, we do rich uh, workshops with brands, we do uh, dashboards, uh, all sorts of different types of visualization. And this insight with them will be, will be important in the planning stage, effectively. Mm -hmm. and, and, and post campaign, figure out what worked, what didn't work. Type. Yeah, and this is where it's uniquely being used in planning and activation and in measurement. Mm. So you're using it in planning to carve out your strategy and brands will come to us with this challenge. They'll look for the hook from the data, create their strategy, run that through to activation, then activate off those audiences and then measure what's happened from planning through to activation. Mm. And that whole, um, whole journey can be then uh, you know, measured throughout. And that's quite a, a modern day application where data being used efficiently with programmatic media buying and then you loop it back round. Um, and this you know, is this all intent driven as well because it's sort of like people, yeah, people are absolutely. searching for. Absolutely, but we also do a lot of brand stuff as well where brands are looking to uh, you know, raise awareness to certain audience groups and search data again is really good for, for uh, identifying audience groups. You know exactly who's a shopping mother, you know exactly who's a frequent traveler, etc. Yeah. So then you can do rich brand engagements and of course brand is brand media activations have now arrived in programmatic in the last year or so. How big of a trend has that been? The brand? Yeah, massive. Yeah. Well, are they looking specifically for video or is it display only? Because it feels to me that they're, they're spending a lot more money on, on the online video space. I think we used to see brand and DR as two separate segments. And I think that's changed now. I think really? How so? I think that all media is now... DR. Needs a response. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, it's all outcomes based. Yeah, I think the response metrics have changed. Yeah. Um, you know... Video with the rise of video, CPC, VV, and and uh, you know viewable views, um, completed views. That's a, uh, you know clearly a different response now to the old school uh, you know cookie dropping with display that still exists. Um, but you know I think but, but brands are looking from, for more. They're, look, they're looking to, to see an ROI aspect to yeah. their spend in video. Absolutely. So it's not about recent frequency. There is there has to be some kind of element of ROI in it, so they can yep. they can basically plug it into our attribution model and make sure it's actually working for them. Yeah, that's absolutely right, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and the more you can look at it before you even start the media, which is where actually using data before you start is really important because you can then see the evolution of the customer journey throughout mm. and that really is an effective way to measure. Okay, so the fifth aspect here is cross-channel media. Now, this is yeah. interesting because I, I'm just making a supposition with this. But given the fragmentation that's happening right now in the system, I think this is probably relating to that, isn't it? We have people who are you know, doing gaming, people who play uh, games on their phone, or play games on consoles, watching sort of uh, catch-up TV, mm -hmm. not all watching linear TV anymore. There's, it, the, the, the whole space is completely fragmented. I guess this relates to that. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, if, you can, if you can export these audiences in real time into a DSP, then you have access to the plethora of media um, you know, options that are out there. And um, that range of media options is dramatically changing right now. I think uh, you know, it's, it started off with you know, really kind of exchange-based um, display buying. So now, you know, it's now, you know, now there's addressable TV, connected TV, yeah. you've got native, you know, um, obviously all these rich media formats, all this kind of stuff, and it's, it's changing drastically and it will continue to, to change. So we now run, you know, pretty much all media across all channels. Like we don't really, you know, whatever the... You don't discriminate the, about no, what channel is. No, no, no. definitely not. Um, but there's two major things, I think, that have been, you know, that, that are really recent, um, you know, parts of this evolution are... With this media, you can now, and there's too many things people start with, um, what is it? Auto, automated um, optimization. And the second thing is dynamic creative. So, 
You can see that audience automated optimization and dynamic creative. Yeah. So let's start with the first one, automated optimization. Yeah, so um, you know, typically you'd have uh, a bunch of traders who are manually optimizing campaigns on DSPs, and we still have those. And, and of course, agency trading desks still have those. Brands who in house it still have those as well. And you know, uh, traders have um, have got a sixth sense and a, an ability to try things that are. You know that a machine will struggle with. Yeah. So there's always a role. The for sense it. of immediate context, the things that people don't, want to, or the sense of a timing, yeah. exactly as well. Yeah, yeah, and based off a legacy of seeing many different scenarios. Yeah, and you know, obviously a machine, it's like it's, it's slightly different. Um, but there is some real big advantages to what you could do with the automated optimization now. So you know, we do we do something called user scoring, where we look at the search terms that are driving conversions and the frequency of them and the level of intent in them. And we essentially uh, can score a user based off their propensity to convert. And with that um, user score, you can then dynamically change the bid and the bid price. And this can be done in an automated fashion. So your, your campaign immediately just starts optimizing itself as you go. So you can either optimize some segments that you've pre-assigned from your strategy, or we actually just put code down on the conversion conversion page of, a, uh, of an online um, advertiser yeah. and you can see all the search terms that are driving conversions and immediately that then optimizes and that kind of informs the algo so do you think this is um, the, the AI I mean, we'll, go on, we'll, we'll go to the dynamic rate but do you think the AI piece is going to kind of make a lot of the trader uh, functions redundant because you know, obviously the machine can basically inform itself quicker than a, than a trader or is the trader always going to have a pro, a, a, an element of uh, input into that process as well mm. I mean, I think I mean you, you've obviously worked, worked in this sector enough. I think it's never just machines. No, you know, there's uh, when, in advertising and and the service layers that go on in this industry. Yeah. There's there's a, a massive need for people involved, um, and I think I just think that the role of a trader will evolve um, over time. And there's still going to be that specialist use case that we've said. You know, there might be, say, we've got 450 brands that we're running with. You know, there might be a couple of hundred that are very simple setups. Mm. You know, just driving performance or whatever it is, and we can automate most of that. And you know, but we have, we will always have many, many campaigns that are, are unique. I remember actually an incident uh, a couple of years ago where Gorman from Media IQ asked me about Gaelic football. He says, uh, "Where, where would I go?" And I says, "Well, you know, try Irish ferries because there's people going back and forth all the time, and his conversion rates are off the scale." <laughs> he didn't give me any money, Gorman. Didn't give me money for that, but. <laughs> There's always going to be an element of, yeah. of, of input from, from traders because they're able to see things that a machine or an algo might not see. Yeah. And there's little trends, little things, little yeah. human behaviours. And your, your example of Gaelic football I think is a really great example. And we see that all the time between these connections between yeah, sections of the ontology where you, you, wouldn't, have, um, you wouldn't have predicted it. You, know, you see non-intuitive things all the time and you should be able to give the marketer the ability to react to that mm. quickly. Mm. And let that become part of the targeting strategy. Otherwise, you're going to have no scale. You're going to be restricted, mm. and you're going to have no fresh ideas. Yeah. And of course, you know it should be fluid. Okay. And the second one is dynamic creative. Well, obviously, dynamic creative has been around for yeah since you know the days of, of when Ari Papara invented like the rich media unit at, at mm -hmm. Google. Here, uh, you know, we've been we've evolving. So, just tell us a bit more about how this affects the cross-channel media piece. Well, I think I think the dynamic creative has been used for years effectively with site retargeting. Um, but now with the range of media that's going on and, and available, I think that you know now we can start to use it in a, in a, in a wider use case. And we, we're doing a lot in video and video trading. I think we're seeing also the, the evolution of creative agencies now to having the way that the production companies are having to create multiple units. Um, yeah, multiple right. uh, different actual digital assets right. based off this. Um, and we're now seeing that hugely in video and, and other brands. When you said digital assets, are you talking about um, just creating for a specific uh, um, context, or or is the, the is the creative process being informed by data itself? Going well, we based on this data, we have to create this, this, and this. That's that exactly it? right. So yeah, we're seeing um, you know an increased demand in using the data to understand what creative should be shown. And if you think about the US, the US has so many different zip codes and totally different dynamics going on in all those different territories mm. that people watching Netflix in a certain you know territory compared to in another territory is completely different. They'll have different uh, outlooks in life, exactly. different sort of uh, you know socioeconomic uh, situations. Correct. And and as such, we can you know we can then uh, inform the creative uh, you know production in the first place. How do you so do that? Can you do that? In, in, can you can you actually show? What ads are working, and then inform the creative agency that we need more of these specific ads. You know what I mean? Like you know, yeah. 
accents, mannerisms, all that kind of stuff. Yep, absolutely. You know, you know, this data can be used all the way through the journey from you know from start to end. You know, it should be used to inform strategy, inform creative selection, creative production, all the way through to media buying and measurement. Mm. Okay, so where where are we at? This is these are five points created, but how do you see this affecting sort of the, the clients you work with? Are they are they sort of embracing this as a, as a as a key part of media strategy, media activation? I mean, obviously, search beforehand, as you said before, was more or less a, a wall garden yeah. where Google just could rinse cash, and obviously Bing made some money as well, but it never really came out into the into the entire ecosystem. And yeah. then you guys were the first to kind of use it in a display context, but now we're seeing this. As programmatic goes into every area, it can it can definitely inform a lot more processes in, in multi-channel. I think that's right. You know, I think um, you know we're certainly seeing it from the demand that we get around the world. You know, I think that there's of course Google is a you know Google is a hugely established business with a fantastic product, and I think there's no you know there's no denying that. I mean, this is a 110 billion revenue business. Yeah. Not, <laughs> it hasn't had much competition in many of not its really. products. You know, no. um, but it has in you know but. Ultimately, there's always going to be a role for Google. I think that this is just um, this is just for the first time it's broken out of you know that mm. that's that siloed walled garden. That's the only way you can use um, search data. I think now we're seeing that we're, uh, it's applicable all the way through from planning, activation, and measurement. And that, this is really the first year where we're starting to see that on mass around the world. So this will be the hang of you. What about what about going forward? What, what do you see sort of happening with this? Like, what, like do you see the next evolution after that? What, well, I, I think the voice is going to continue to evolve. Um, I think that the it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the device war because of this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the, this is going to be a, who gets to own the the home basically. Yeah. Uh, Do you think that mobile the mobile devices uh, will still be there'll be still an opportunity for publishers to kind of like use the app and the, a mobile device to sort of own part of that market? Mm. I, I, because you see what Amazon happened the minute like you know. If you said to Alexa, for instance, batteries, they're going to take Amazon-owned batteries as opposed to Duracell. Like they, 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 mm. they can sort of, yeah. uh, well, they, they can own that. Yeah, and they've, own got that. Fa- they've got fantastic uh, data as well to do that. You know, they can obviously pick up on what trends are going on and, and, and take advantage of that. Um, I think that you know, I think it's a worrying thing for for the world if we we get restricted into a couple of options yeah. as consumers. And I, and I think that the good thing is about there being disparate devices here. Is that they're not going to be merging anytime soon? You know? No. They, so that creates where there's complexity in the sector. That creates opportunity for everyone else. And I think you know certainly publishers taking back control of their voice search data is a really big shift that will happen over mm. the next couple of years. Um, and then of course I think that the, the big one is is what's going to happen to the the TV uh, the TV ad industry. Yes. With all this that's going on. Yeah. You know, there's only one way this is going to go, and I think that's going to be uh, it's definitely starting to happen already. And um, you know the device, the, the device, and the con- every consumer's individual device graph. Ultimately, um, you know that's going to become, you know, it's going to become an ecosystem around a household and around a consumer that starts to have, you know, a, a more fluid transaction of data and media together, which has been again kept siloed for quite mm, a while, mm. um, and that's of course going to lead to all that ad spend, you know, the evolution of that that sector, which is a huge, huge, vast amount of uh, ad spend. So. Dom, thanks very much. As you said, 2018 is the epoch year for media. And Dom, thank you for coming to the office to talk about the search aspect of that. And we'll, we'll see you at ATS London because Dom is speaking on our CEO panel. Make sure you get tickets. There's only a handful left. So, and we'll see you next time on Trade Talk TV. Thank you.